subscribe to our YouTube channel and press the bell icon to get the latest updates. So you are a global social entrepreneur, banker, economist and a civil society leader who has been awarded with the Nobel Peace Prize for founding the Grameen Bank and pioneering the concepts of microcredit and microfinance. Uh, you've been creating so uh, with alongside Grameen Bank and shown that even the poorest of the poor can work to bring about their own development. You've received several national and international honors. Sir. You've received the United States Presidential Medal of Freedom, the Congressional Gold Medal in 2010, and you've been consistently been rated as the top global thinkers of all times. We are so honored, sir, to have uh, your company today. Uh, we'll start with the title. So when we all talk about uh, recovery, you've spoken, sir, about reconstruction. What is the difference and what are we, uh, what are we reconstructing in the post-corona uh, state, sir? I was trying to uh, draw attention to the fact that uh, corona has brought the global economic machine uh, to collapse. So the machine is in sleeping condition and in a coma right now. So there's a tremendous amount of effort all around how to wake up the machine so that we can start the engine and go back where we are coming from. And that is usually known as recovery, recovery of the system, which uh, uh, we lost it, now we recover it, we go back to the system. And my question is, uh, should we go back? Uh, the reason I raised that issue, I point out that the world that we are coming from about five months, six months back, was not a very happy world. Uh, in a way, it's a terrible world. We were counting days for our uh, destruction, our disappearance. Uh, we were talking about the global warming. Global warming was giving us notice after notice that uh, you don't have much time left before you move from 1.5 degrees Celsius uh, temperature to two degree Celsius and that's it. And it may happen in the next two or three decades and it will be an unlivable planet. So this is the direction we are going. And with Corona stopping that machine, uh, we are not doing any contribution to the global warming. It's a, a happy world right now. No global warming taking place. We can breathe easy. And then the second one, the terrible thing was happening is uh, wealth concentration. All the wealth of the world is getting concentrated in very few hands. And that process was continuing to the extent that it's becoming a ticking time bomb. It can explode anytime, politically, socially. Uh, because this is a strange situation where uh, almost uh, I was giving example that uh, if you consider the body and if all the blood in your body comes to your fingertip and it dries up the entire body, uh, that's extremely uh, dangerous situation. So that's exactly what is happening to our economy. All the wealth of the world is concentrated to, in the hands of 1% uh, of the population. So 99% of the population has only 1% of the global wealth. So that's almost like the uh, situation in our body with the blood concentrating in one fingertip. I said, this is again a totally uh, unsustainable. It, it can collapse anytime. Third one that I raised, is the danger that we had faced was the massive unemployment created by uh, artificial intelligence. It's on the way. It's a matter of days now when not only millions, billions of people will be out of jobs. It's a question of uh, uh, 10, 15, 20 years. So that's not much time either. So that's the point that the uh, corona stopped us when uh, we are just uh, in the countdown situation. So I said, should we go back? Is it worthwhile? And I said that this is like uh, going back would be like uh, committing suicide, knowing fully well there's the end of everything, end of the road. And we still want to go back because we are so mesmerized by the system, we don't know anything else. I said, uh, a sane person will decide uh, that we don't want to go back. No going back is the sane decision. So if you're not going back, our, what is our alternative? We have to build another system. This engine is done, we don't want to. 
standard engine. We need a different engine, which will, which will take us to a different direction. And it's uh, like uh, riding a train. Train is moving in the direction of a cliff, which will fall on the cliff. We are coming very close to that cliff. And suddenly train stopped. Corona has stopped the train. So now we got off the train, taking a breath and saying, what's happening? And then we saw we are in a path to the cliff. So we don't want to get back to the same train, go in the same direction. So we need a new train to take us to a new direction. And that's the direction that we are looking for. So uh, that's what I was doing, the construction. This doesn't quite express what I wanted to mean. But uh, a new engine, a new uh, reconfiguration of the economy and the destination of the economy. And whatever we do, we want to uh, create a world which will be free from global warming, zero net carbon emission, and will be free from wealth concentration because that's where we are coming from, that we don't want to go back. And it will be free from artificial intelligence which creates a massive unemployment. And it can be done, and I argued that uh, how it can be done. So we, if we put pay our attention to it, uh, we can uh, get that engine built and move in the different direction. So that's what we are waiting for, that uh, we need to do. Not going back uh, is the decision we have to take. Excellent. So, sir, so you talked about, you know, the concentration of wealth. You talked about not going back uh, is another part. And how do you re-channelize the entire exercise? What would be your top three goals that you would want to achieve out of this reconstruction? I uh, just mentioned that. I'll repeat. We want to create a new economic structure, which will take us to the world where there will be no global warming. So economy, economy created the global warming. It's not uh, something created by God or some supernatural uh, power. It's done by us through our businesses and so on. Uh, so we want to make sure the new world that we create doesn't have the element of global warming at all. It's a zero. We reach the zero net carbon emission. That's a purpose. That's an objective. So in order to do that, uh, while we are building up the engine, we also have, the, uh, have to create the checkpoints. When we go to that world, you have to pass through these checkpoints. If you have anything carrying from the old world, which will destroy our planet by global warming, will stop you there. If you are carrying fossil fuel industry with you, we say, sorry, you cannot do that. We don't want to take your fossil fuel with you because we want to be free. Uh, if you are carrying plastic with you, we say, no, there's no plastic in this new world. So those kind of things, that's okay. we know the list. So in the check post, they will check you and some will have uh, elements of it. We say you remove these elements and you are clean, you can go in. So we'll have a virus checking like we do the coronavirus checking. We do the virus of the old world should not enter in the new world. So that's the way that you have to do it. You have to be very strict because otherwise you risk your life. Uh, our life uh, is uh, uh, done. But uh, children's life is the beginning. That's why you have the demonstration on the street or the uh, future for the Fridays for the future. They were accusing us, accusing us that you are a responsible generation. You did think uh, so harmful to us. We have a, you have not left anything, any future for us. So this is our younger generation in our families accusing their older generation in the families that you are irresponsible. You are. Uh, you have not uh, taken your life uh, in a way that it will be safe for your next generation. Imagine what our grandchildren will say, because they will not be able to cross their childhood even, forget about the teenage. Uh, so that's the kind of thing we don't want to repeat. That We want to make sure we hand over the planet that we inherited safer than when we inherited. And we'll tell our children that when you take it, you have to hand it over safer than you got it, so that each generation will have a safer world than the other way around. Today, we are making it a more harmful world as we pass on to our, our children. That has to be reversed. Excellent. I'm, I'm, I'm glad that uh, you've been so, uh, uh, you know, guided uh, about the entire exercise. And, and yes, we have to leave a better world. And I think a lot of reasoning, as you mentioned, sir, initially, is also because of the concentration. 
uh, of whether it is concentration of wealth, whether it is concentration of people, what we call the urbanized pockets, uh, which are also responsible for large part of emissions and large part of uh, changes, the environmental changes that we are seeing. With COVID happening, sir, a lot of uh, reverse migration has taken place, and not just internationally, but within the countries. I mean, if you look at Bangladesh, I'm sure, you know, from Dhaka, people are moving out um, into going back to their home places. And India has seen massive uh, uh, reverse migration in terms of, you know, people going from Delhi, Mumbai, Chennai, Bangalore, back to their hometowns. What will, what will happen there, sir? What do you think would be the changes uh, after this migration? One, do you think that they, these people are coming back uh, to the centers? Or do you think the centers themselves, the economic centers and their centers of activity themselves will change and therefore contribute to a larger or a better spread uh, economic, financial and environmental activity? Well, the corona has done us more favor than one. I just mentioned one that uh, gives us a great opportunity to save ourselves. It's a gift that corona has given to us. Uh, otherwise, we'd be just riding the train and finish the job and jump off the cliff. It's, uh, nobody could stop us. But the corona luckily stopped us and gave us a chance. And corona has given another chance to look at ourselves, which we didn't see before. It's like... Uh, having a, a big water body or ocean or something or a river, suddenly they, it dried up, all the water gone. Then we start seeing things which you never saw before under the water. So Corona suddenly let us have a look at our own society. We never felt that before. And one of the things we saw how horrible the life is at the bottom. The moment it happened, the moment the machine stopped, Suddenly, they have no place to go, no place to eat, no place to eat uh, on anything. System didn't provide any kind of security for them. And that's why you have a massive migration of people from distant places, desperately trying to go home, thousand mile journey on foot. How desperate can you get to make the journey start? That is, they have no idea what they're going, but they are on foot on the highway to see if there's any way they can get home a thousand miles away. First of all, what pushed them away from their home, from their family, from their village where they were born? Something is wrong in our economy, which makes this terrible thing to do. For nobody, has to, nobody wants to leave the family. Nobody wants to leave their children home, their family home, and go in unknown places, live in slums, and desperately work for little money so that they can send money home so that they can take care of themselves. What is the economy that we build? We talk about the growth, we talk about all the wealth and so on, all the technology, but what happened to those millions of people? So we have to look at ourselves, the, the, the way that we ignored all these things. Now it brought right in front of our eyes. Why rural economy is different? Why rural economy uh, we designed the rural economy as a kind of a factory for labor supply. It's, it's not, it doesn't have any role. It, all it does as, uh, in our book, in our theory, is, is a factory for labor supply. You, uh, unlimited labor will come and get you to do the things that you want to do for yourself. You don't care what happens to their life. And then you see uh, unemployed young people leaving their home, leaving their place to, in search of their future. Again, there's nothing there. Why is nothing there? So I said, this is a time to review that, why things are uh, treated, uh, rural areas are treated as some like a uh, back, uh, backyard of the uh, economy, real economy, in the urban centers, all the uh, growth centers that we talk about. Uh, is that so, or we just made them so? I said that this is the right time to d define what the rural economy is all about. Rural economy has the capacity to be parallel economy. Uh, their own uh, opportunities for work and so on. I said, in the rural economy, one of the things that we should be defining right from the beginning, nobody has to leave uh, more than 100 miles to find a living uh, livelihood within uh, that place. Uh, within the place where I'm born. Why should I leave the place where? And it's possible. The, today, it's, we are only a primary produce supplier, or labor supplier. Why should we give those primary produce to the city? Why don't we process ourselves? 
we have the labor. We don't have to send the labor to process you in the urban center. The labor is right here, food is right here, and we process it and send it to you. Sell it to you. It's an independent business proposition. So we become uh, our own uh, um, economy, but it's a parallel economy. So that question is will be very clear. Why don't we create a parallel economy? Then we don't have to send anybody from here. It will be mutual. You send people to work here. We send people to work there. It's a mutual action. It's always a one-way traffic. It's a labor factory. We do that. We produce it for you. That should not be it. So this is a challenge now we have to do. Uh, address that in the parallel economy. And we today, given the technology, uh, location is totally immaterial infrastructure for which uh, urban centers grew because it had infrastructure. Today, that is not a valid proposition anymore. But it's still out of habit. We are still doing the same thing. We send everybody to uh, go to the urban center. We can do exactly the same thing in the rural areas. Rural areas may be more attractive because we can make rural areas as a green economy, as a, as a uh, smart economy, because cities cannot do that. Rural economies can do that because they are starting from the beginning. You did it for 100 years and you're stuck with whatever you have done. So we have a fresh start for here. And young people are as good as anybody else in the world. So why do we have to send our young people to you? They stay where they are and they produce it. And you can create business wherever you are. Today, technology makes it happen that uh, uh, you can go straight to the international market from your rural areas. You don't have to go to the city, transport it from Sydney, not anymore. But out of habit, we have been doing that. So Corona has pushed us all this picture in front of us and made sure that the things that we do, think, the way we think, the old kind of thinking has to be abandoned, new thinking has to be adopted. So we have to come back and create a robust rural economy, competing and collaborating with the uh, urban economy. And that expands the capacity because those people in the rural areas, they're the majority of the population of the whole country. They have enormous creative power, but you have blocked them up. Their hands are uh, tied. They cannot function because there is nothing there. We have not created anything. Why we have to send our children to... Uh, urban, urban centers to send to universities and to colleges and so on. Why? What's wrong with the villages having their beautiful universities, uh, medical college, IITs and all kinds of things so that we can train our young people right here to understand the rural economy, build rural institutions, not uh, uh, urban institutions come to the rural areas and try to advise you how to run your thing. So we are smart enough in the rural areas uh, to take care of ourselves and tell you how to run business. And we uh, can do that, provided we create our own uh, education institute, health institution. If you're sick, you send, to the, uh, send the, uh, the sick person to the city to get treatment. Why is that? India has enormous example, varieties of examples of a world-class healthcare program based in rural areas. But there are few. Why can't we do more? that world-class healthcare system, right, operating in the uh, urban areas, so that people in the urban areas will come and have a treatment in the rural areas rather than going the other way around. And they will, their children will come and study in our agricultural colleges and engineering colleges and medical colleges so that we are ahead of everybody else. We are, we are pro providing the leadership. So that kind of thing is very important. Otherwise, we just fall into the same trap, doing the same thing all over again and go back, back to the same trap and make this uh, world the way it is. So just a leading question to that. You, you made a very, very valuable point that, you know, we need to create education, health and related infrastructure in the rural areas. But of course, you know, as we know in the subcontinent and in, in a de democratic and, and, and federal setup, uh, these are both a function of will and of course time. Uh, both money and, and, and time investment. So while that'll, that'll emerge, sir, but do you think in the near term, what would be the other uh, yeah. economic activities or economic opportunities emerging in these rural areas? You talked about the parallel economies also. So what do you think? They're largely agriculture, agro-based economy, uh, uh, economic activity, right? I mean, these areas. What are the other sectors that you, do you see emerging? What are the other opportunities in the near to medium term emerging in these, uh, in the rural setups uh, to build a greater local infrastructure and, 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 uh, and embed us? 
Well, you missed out the whole uh, new sector, the IT sector. You don't have to be in the urban areas to do the IT, world-class IT, doing a, in the rural areas. Why not? You don't need a big factory to do that. This is your laptop and yourself and your ideas. That's all. So you can have a roaring business running out of the rural areas and so on and so forth. So today's business is like that. It's not about a factory, a labor, fact, have a uh, 10 o'clock and 5 o'clock uh, timeline, uh, people coming out of the factory, going inside the factory. That's not the, the modern business. All the artificial intelligence we're talking about, artificial intelligence could be a curse, artificial intelligence could be a blessing. So we developed that artificial blessing part. And right there, create all kinds of services, healthcare services, education services, uh, whatever interaction uh, we need to do with the artificial intelligence. So we produce you, we produce those things for you. And all we do is designing, it's paper and pencil, that's all, in our laptop and that's it. So it's a, it's a completely different kind of thing. So it's a, it's a, it's a must convenient, is a healthy uh, air rather than a polluted air in the city. And all the time you spend on your transportation from one point to point one to point B, here you are with the nature. You sit there under the tree and do your uh, whatever design you are doing. So those kind of things. So it's a, it's a possible, it's, it's not only possible, it's a much more realistic than having those uh, people working in Bangalore uh, camped into those little rooms uh, on these tiny little roads uh, heading for that. Why don't you go out to a beautiful state? Spread yourself out and make it happen. So those are the kind of things. It's a, it's a question of making up the mind, then everything else follows from that. And also I should quickly add um, and the informal sector, which is a huge informal sector. And that's also Corona's blessing that it revealed the uh, helplessness of the uh, what you call uh, informal sector. I'm very much against the word informal sector, the terminology informal sector. It gives the impression that it's some kind of waiting room. People are waiting so that they can go into the formal sector and there's nothing to do in the waiting room just to count numbers, count days when we get, get to the formal sector. I said that's shame to describe that scenario and then wash up your hands, you have nothing to do and let people survive on their own. Not, neither government has any role to play, neither uh, business have any role to play. You are on your own. So I sell little uh, trinkets on the street, little food on the street uh, for survival purpose because nobody's paying attention to me. And But I'm the majority of the workforce in the country. In India, about 65% of the people are in informal sector, but no attention. I said, the reason there's no attention because it's conceived as a waiting room. So we are, we're trying to create jobs for them in the formal sector. I said, that's an absolutely wrong way. This is not a waiting room. This is the powerhouse of the economy. They are the one who does things on their own. They are creative people. So I should, I, I, first thing I try to do, rename it. The informal sector is a bad name. It's a derogatory name. This is the micro entrepreneur sector. These are all micro entrepreneurs. They are on their own. And that's what happened. Corona has made them uh, totally uh, without livelihood. Their livelihood is gone. And then we notice them. Otherwise, we don't notice them. They are all around us. In the morning, they sell something. In the noon, they sell something else. In the evening, they are selling something else. Their dress has changed. Same person. But they do different things. And we enjoy it. We convenient. We take care of ourselves and take care of them. So this is the micro-entrepreneur sector. So the labor sector has, since it's a formal sector, it has attracted a lot of policy decisions, a lot of policy issues, a lot of government actions, a lot of institution building. Labor even has a labor ministry. Have you ever heard of ministry of micro-entrepreneurs? No. Why not? We are abundant. These are abundant people. These are, if we give them as a status of micro-entrepreneurs, immediately, you have to create a ministry of uh, uh, micro-entrepreneurs because they need financing, they need uh, legal issues, uh, how to deal with the government sector because government sector is a very complicated thing. That's why they are in the informal sector. They cannot get in, they cannot move. So I always propose an agency by the government 
who will be assisting micro entrepreneurs to deal with the government. Their only job is to be with them. How to interpret things, how to get things done. They're, they're, they'll be their assistant, micro entrepreneurs' assistant. And that's their job. To make those micro entrepreneurs successful is their success. And why not? Because you made rules and comp- such a language and the formats and the reporting things so complicated. It's beyond their comprehension. So they remain underground so that you don't see them out of necessity. If you make them visible, they will fly. They are as good as anybody else. Many of the successful business people in India started as the street uh, vendors. So street vendors uh, don't have to be street vendors. Those are the lucky people. They had some connections, some opening and made it. Others can't, can't do it. So why don't we create that Ministry of Microentrepreneurs and Ministry of uh, Agency for assisting and promoting the microentrepreneurs, a dedicated assistant to the uh, micro entrepreneurs, every single one of them, they know where to go. If they have any problem with the police is throwing them out on the street. They say, police is throwing, is this something I'm doing wrong? They say, no, you're not you're doing absolutely right. Government gives you protection, I'll deal with them. So they become the original. It's possible. So you have an entire new group of people building up the economy from the bottom. That's the strength of the economy. Building on the top is not the strength of the economy. Building from the bottom is the strength of the economy. That's what it should be. Absolutely, sir. Absolutely. So uh, now coming to the, you know, the liquidity part, we talked about the micro entrepreneurs. And, and as you mentioned, they're out of job, they're out of livelihood. There is a massive liquidity crunch. There's a massive cash crunch. Uh, even the government is trying to help and the local system is trying to help. And, and therefore, you know, the role of microfinance will now become extremely, extremely critical. So what do you think, sir, in building the rural economy henceforth, uh, do, what role do you think microfinance will hold uh, as the uh, as the uh, as a growth driver, and also the larger financial inclusion, and perhaps taking to to a stage where more and more micro entrepreneurs reemerge and resurrect themselves? Yeah, I said so far micro uh, uh, micro credit and all these uh, uh, financial services that India has spread out still in a very small shape, but given the size of the country is big, but the necessity is so big. So the moment you want to recognize the informal sector as the new entrepreneur sector, you need a whole financial system working for them. So microcredit that we know today, lending money to the women in the villages and raising chicken, which is good, but it has a whole world waiting for them. To, to take care of the economy, which a formal bank will not take care of. Formal bank will never come near them. So they remain, as it is right now, the victims of loan sharks. They are the, the, the prime meat for the loan sharks. Loan sharks re- thrive on their, because, because of the informal sector, the loan sharking thrives in the country. So the moment you bring in the micro credit, you have a ready market. People are need the money, but the only place you go is uh, the guy who comes on a cycle and give you the money and then break your leg when you don't give the money. That's, that's the circle. So why don't we give it a formal shape like micro credit has shown the way it can be done? Do that. So the micro credit future is ex- should be expanding. You have to give formal recognition to this, create formal... Uh, give formal licenses uh, to create banking to, so that they can take deposit. You know, hundreds and hundreds of MFIs in India, they can't take any deposit. Only they can do is lend money. They have to go and go to the bank to borrow money to lend, to lend money to the poor people. And they're doing year after year and have a good record, but it still it's not recognized. After many, many uh, kind of pointing it out. Finally, a small finance banking license was given, but only to a limited. It was a very good idea. They have done that, but to a limited number. So I said, why still cor- with the corona now is a good time to take bold decision. Make every MFI, every single microfinance institution, give them the permission, give them the license to mobilize deposit so that they can run. Today, they are, they are uh, walking on one foot. Other foot, is not there. They can lend, but they cannot take deposit. You cannot run something with one leg. 
So you have to have two legs. When they deposit, taking a little, then you run and give them the banking license. They are doing the banking. What's wrong with giving the banking license? Then I said for time for one important thing about uh, microcredit that India has done and wonderful thing. They adopted microcredit in a big way, but they left out two elements, two features of microcredit that we did in Bangladesh. One, we conceive microcredit as a social business. Meaning it's a business not to make money out of poor people. It's a business to help them. We call it social business. It's a problem-solving banking, not money-making banking. It makes profit. Profit stays with the bank, not with the owners. Owners don't take any profit because they want to create this to save the people, help the people. So that part was missing when it's adopted. It became a profit-seeking or it became an NGO absolutely no business kind of uh, structure. So why don't we give them the social business, small finance bank license, social business, so that you don't use the license to make money to get back to the city, have big buildings and big villas for yourself. That was not the intention of the license. License is to help poor people. And if you're interested, here is the license. You get, go your, start your uh, mobilization of uh, rural savings. Why the rural savings should, has to go to banks to mop it up, to go to the city and invest it there. You see, it's a very strange thing. Rural economy needs capital, but the, all the capital, all the deposits uh, go straight to the city, to the banking system. So the whole idea is banking system should be retaining the savings of the rural areas to invest in the rural areas. That's why we need exclusive banks, exclusive financial institutions, which will be rural financial institutions. And I give the example of Grameen Bank. We call it Grameen Bank, a village bank. And it truly it is village bank. Our, we made it into law. We are now 43 years in operation. We have more than uh, 200, 2,600 branches in the country in Bangladesh. Every single village in Bangladesh, Grameen Bank operates. Every single village. There are 80,000 villages in Bangladesh. But not a single branch is located in any city of Bangladesh, any municipality in Bangladesh. We say this is a rural bank, it stays in the rural area. So your aptitude, your design, your way of thinking, it's completely different. You have nothing to do with the cities. You want to sell people who are in the city rural areas. Many people ask, don't they have re- poor people in the city? I said, yes, but we'll create another one. But don't disturb this one. This is just dedicated for the things that the rural area needs. So we need those dedicated rural inst- financial institutions, investment funds, um, equity funds, and all kinds of things. All social business equity funds, post- social business venture capital fund, all dedicated to the rural area. So the young people as they become uh, uh, able to start a business, here is the money. The venture capital will come. I'm your partner. Go ahead, start your business. I'm a social business. I'm not taking any money out of you. You just return the money I gave you. And that's it. What's the big deal about it? And then I don't have to go for a job in the city. I know how to create a business here. I start packing things. I start doing things, sell, sending it to the urban areas. I have the uh, internet uh, business. I supply everything to the city right here. I create all those things ourselves. It's possible. So this is how the whole conceptualization has to start. It's the financial institution, microcredit. Microcredit is today is only limited microcredit. We have to open up to cover for every single uh, person who is... Uh, a new, uh, the micro entrepreneur, the, anybody that you see on the street selling things, he has a big banker behind it, and he knows how to grow, how to do, how to handle crisis in business. You have to you have to handle crisis. So we know together with the financial institution, that financial institution luckily is a, a social business financial institution. It's not coming here to get me get everything that I earn to give it to him in the compound interest. I borrow one rupee and I have to pay 10 rupee because of the compound interest. That's not the financial institution you have. He owns one rupee back, that's all. That's a social business. He doesn't want anything else. That's the way it should be. This is it's possible and we can do that. Whether microcredit can go over the crisis created by um, Corona, the answer is very simple, yes. 
because I, I can give you the example of uh, Grameen Bank. Grameen Bank, as I said, 43 years. Uh, Bangladesh is a country of disasters. Always something happening. Flood is a common phenomenon. Some floods are terrible floods. Almost not only half, 60%, 70% of the country is underwater. First long time, for one week, two weeks. So everything is destroyed. So then flood may not be national, maybe just regional, but maybe it's your region who is under the flood. For you, it's a complete world because you lost everything. Your home is gone, the first thing you have. Your animals are gone, your goats, your chickens, your uh, uh, cattle, everything is gone, your fish is gone. This is the core of the economy of a household in a rural village. Your animals, your fish, your uh, uh, house, that's all, all gone. You have only survived. Your capital, your everything is gone. So you start all over again. It's much worse than Corona. And then has the cyclones, very famous area for cyclones. Always some area of Bangladesh is hit by cyclone. Some are disastrous cyclone. Some in history, we had hundred thousands of people are just flushed away from the country out of the tidal wave created by cyclone. So we survived that. And the, I said every single village has a microcredit program, Grameen program. So not only we survive ev after every disaster, our commitment is we have to build life better than that we have come back, come, we are coming from. That's our commitment. And we tell our staff all the time, look, microcredit is not about money. Microcredit is about people. So you don't forget the people. If people survive, microcredit survive. If people survive, Grameen Bank survive. If people don't survive, you have nothing. Go home. You have no job. So make sure that you understand that. You stand behind that. Fight with them so that they can, they can continue with their life in a better way. Not just somehow they are going. No. We, we have the money. Our part is to come and provide that funding in a, an appropriate way so that they don't misuse it. They understand the responsibility of it so that they can continue. So I would say the corona crisis will not uh, uh, hurt the microfinance. It will strengthen the microfinance because they know how to fight. And they Definitely. will learn. And, and one person who will be very happy to hear this is waiting in the wings, uh, Mr. Prashant Tucker. But before that said, one, one last question, uh, before, if I can ask, is uh, uh, you, you talked about, you know, uh, microfinance uh, business as such being a social business, being a problem solving business rather right, than right. Uh, you know, a profit uh, for profit organization. If you were, sir, advising the microfinance institutions and government in India today or in the subcontinent generally, what three things that you would tell them to do on an immediate basis, which would have an immediate impact? Uh, right away, I, I told it, but I repeat it. Right away, I will say this is the time to take bold decision and take the decision to issue license for social business, small finance banks, anybody who is involved in microfinance, give them the license and watch them, see if they can survive. If not, they can go. But you give them the license or the record that they already built up. So this is number one. And it has to be a social business license, not a license to make money for the owners of those businesses. And that's it. And then open that up for microfinance, social business microfinance for the entire uh, uh, sector called uh, new entrepreneur sector or uh, micro entrepreneur sector. It's not just the one that we talk about traditionally what the microfinance does. It's much bigger than that. Uh, every street, every home, every place they, have, they are there. Every railway station, every uh, parking area, they have that. So you in, take over the responsibility of financing the entire new entrepreneur area or the uh, micro entrepreneur area. Give them the support of the microfinance in a social business way. So you create license of that. Number two, I'll suggest that all the banks, see that one of the things Nabat has done way back in the middle of 1990s, uh, I had a lot of debates with them, but they did it, self-help groups. They instructed every single bank in the country to deliver microcredit to their branches, every single branches. They did it. They, they, they obeyed it because there's a uh, regulation that you have to put the priority sector lending and so on and so forth. So they were doing that. 
I said, now you could take a bolder decision than that. You ask every single bank to create social big business, small finance bank as a subsidiary of every bank. Every bank has to have social business, microfinance, as well as small finance bank tagged with them. This will be devoted to this. This is their territory and particularly focused on the rural areas. These subsidiaries will be based in rural areas to build up the rural areas. Concentrate on that. So show that all these years that you have brought money out of the rural areas, now your responsibility as a social business, uh, microfinance, uh, sorry, uh, small finance bank, you deliver that. Idea is there should not be anybody who is excluded from the microfinance. As long as you are in some kind of business, you, we can talk. We can see how we can help you. If you need financing, we also provide you equity so that you can start. The, because most of the micro entrepreneurs start with empty hands. That's why the loan sharking is such a gorgeous thing for them. They get the money from them, but in the end, they lose all the money to them. So now you substitute all the loan sharks. So the loan sharks will be replaced. So that you create those subsidiaries, rural subsidiaries of uh, existing banks, which will be social business, small finance bank, addressed to uh, uh, the, all the uh, micro entrepreneurs of all kinds, all shapes, the old, young, uh, migrant workers. Why the migrant workers have to go back again after walking back into their homes? Why don't they come and say, no, you don't have to. If you have an idea how to run a business, I finance you. Stay where you live. So nobody has to leave home. Nobody has to leave the place where they are born. This is our commitment. And we can do that. All we need to have is the right kind of an institution. So this is what I will advise that you do that. And of course, I mentioned the last one, it's a very important one, create a ministry for micro entrepreneurs dedicated to helping them succeed with the institutions, with the policy, with the regulations, and helping them to deal with the government agencies, government offices. Government efforts is a terror for them. They quit business because they can't, toler- they can't survive those uh, interaction with the government offices. So make them very comfortable with the government. They have their, the government has put their agents for them. They do the, all the business of the government offices. They understand each other's language. And I understand the guy who could, talks to me, his language, and we are fine. So the women and the Dalits and all the leftover uh, of the society cannot be uh, 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 rejected from any ground that I go and speak the language. I don't know how to talk to people. I only know how to make them, how to prepare it. They are excellent craftsmen, but you don't know how to deal with the government, fill up the forms and do this and do that. And then they say, oh, it's illegal. And you go to the police station as a criminal. So that we don't want to do. Absolutely. Thank you very much, sir. At that note, sir, may I please welcome our uh, our special guest uh, uh, today, sir, uh, Prashant Thakkar. Prashant is currently the board director and CEO at Central Microcredit. And uh, I thought he'd be a, an excellent uh, a person to ask you a few questions and, and gain your uh, insights on, uh, on the impact investment that he has been a uh, part of. Uh, he's also launched an impact debt fund, investing medium to long-term debt in growth stage impact SMEs. He's based in Mumbai, and uh, I welcome Prashant, uh, you to uh, to ask your set of questions. Thank you, thank you, uh, Deep Shikhar. Hello, Prashant. Hi. So, hello, Professor Yunus. It's an absolute honor to be in conversation with you. Thank um, you. Thank you. I, I have learned so much um, from you, and and have been implementing so many of your ideas and wisdom in, in, in my life. And, um, you know, I'm, as, as, as Deepshika mentioned, I run Centrum Microcredit, which follows the Grameen methodology of joint uh, right. lending. And right. sir, um, also you would be glad to know that um, the, the gentleman running the Union Social Business Fund in India, Suresh Krishna, is okay. on the board. Wow, wow. He's wow. a very, very good friend. friend. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> very good friend. So it's, uh, yeah. uh, Professor, I had, you know, I, th- I think all, all the points you mentioned were very, very valid. Uh, I think it's time to really rebuild and, and, and strengthen the rural economy, bring it and balance so that um, our mother earth can benefit, you know, the, the concentration of wealth is, 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 is all, all, all the residents sort of enjoy that. Um, the one thing that may sort of stop this, uh, stop us from doing this is that when we go back and when I go back to see my clients in rural India is that there is a clear lack of um, skills or understanding of how to go about it. 
um there is a role for the government to play there is a role for the for the private sector to play but i fear that sometimes imparting the skills or training whether it is livelihood development or skills may actually take a long time uh, you know 5 years 10 years maybe even a generation before the rural youth can feel confident about you know staying back in their in their homes and and launching new businesses or supporting uh, as you said complementing the 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 urban economy what are your thoughts around that sir how do we institutionalize the 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 skill development of of our our our, our rural brethren to sort of come up to uh, what we are expecting to do in terms of rebalancing the economy well uh, let me uh, narrate the journey that i have taken along the way because facing this question exactly the same question so what i did i said i'm not training anybody they are already super trained for me as far as i am concerned i don't have to teach a woman how to raise chicken she is already doing it either she does it for herself or she is hired to do it for somebody else because most of these people are hired to take care of their animals not to take care of your gardens not to take care of your agriculture these are hired people because they don't have the money they have the skill simply money is the missing part as as such i became your hired labor and you don't know a thing how to raise a cow how to raise a chicken but i do it for you because you feed me that's all you do you give me food and i take care of your chicken you give me food and a little bit of monthly uh, amount and i take care of cattle day and night i work i milk them i sell the milk for you and you earn the money from them then so i know all those things i done the workshop because i'm the mechanic i am a literate person but i'm a super mechanic but you own it you don't know a thing about the machine but you make the money so i said they have that i'm going to in the first round this is what i want to do people who work for somebody else and they have the skill i give the money to do with not to work for that guy you do it yourself I said why are you working for them all the rickshaws this i'm narrating from my history that i grew up yes. uh, the rickshaws dhaka city is filled with hundreds of thousands of rickshaws and none of them are owned by the rickshaw pullers is owned by the gentleman who works in the office he, he has 20 rickshaws he rents it out there's a guy who looks after his rickshaws and these guys come pay up front for the whole day or half the day usually half day and you have to work hard to bring that money for the rickshaw owner and then whatever you earn is yours and i said look if i have given the money to buy the rickshaw himself he will be making twice as much every day and pay back the bank loan instead of giving it to the guy who owns it and never adds it up and i keep on doing it year after year still i don't own it if i do it one year i become the owner because i have paid back the bank who financed me to, to get the rickshaw so these are the things so i'm simplifying it but this is it and then i mentioned in, a, in our discussion prior to this i said why do we have to send our children to city to learn things why don't they build those education and also in the rural areas yourself and the best is university engineering college or medical college and so on so that our young people can go and become experts on that and the vocational schools so that i if i need something to upgrade i just go for 6 months i i got it done and come back and i carry on and with my business why i run business i also at the same time i attend some vocational school some social business vocational school who is design exactly what i need and i do that is possible i'm i don't leave the problem to somebody else i create it within my circle so that i create this create that and so on and so forth so all the skills all the things all the way to understand what the business is i don't have to be an mba or the one that i have to serve in a big company i know i want to learn basic things about running my business so there will be exactly the type of thing i am curious to know how to handle this and they will have a small course for 3 days 10 days 15 days and i'll learn while i'm running the business i'm a businessman i don't have time to spare so within that i get it done is possible and i pay for it it's not a free education i don't want any free education i want to pay and i want to get it worth the money that i spent on you so this is the direction that i want to go and social business can be very helpful because money making business takes 
puts it around, do, does it in a completely different way. So this is the way I would like to do. And it's possible. And we have created, for example, nursing college. Bangladesh doesn't have any nurses. So what we did, we created a social business nursing college. And within five years, that became the best nursing college in the country. Now, all the hospitals in Dhaka City wait for the nurses from the, from the college that we have established because they get the best grade, the best kind of nursing education out of nowhere. We thought this is a place we can help this girls from the villages to become good quality nurses. And their quality is so good. Now international agencies are coming to hire them to take them away from uh, Bangladesh to work in the UK, work in Japan and so on. I said, that's good. We have millions of young girls in Bangladesh. All we have to do is to create more of this. And it's a social business. It's not a charity. We don't do it free because Grameen Bank gives them the loan to study. And after they get the nursing college, uh, nursing job, they pay back the money and they're on their own. So we make everything self financing Right. Right. Great. Thank you for that, Professor. Thank you. Thank you, Prashant. Lovely having you uh, with us. Sir. We are running out of time. Right. And, uh, but this is where we take uh, a few questions, sir, with your permission. Right. I right. have... Uh, uh, Mr. Kumar, sir. Mr. Kumar is uh, is a thought leader in himself, uh, an entrepreneur, and uh, is the past president at Thai Kerala. Uh, Mr. Kumar asks, a uh, very inspirational ad address, uh, sir. Thank you very much. Informal sector to be named as micro entrepreneurial sector. Uh, we from Thai would like to take it forward. Uh, we do agree COVID has shown up a new direction. One question, is the high unemployment levels due to AI. Aren't there structural and directional misplaced priorities to be addressed? Yes, of course. This is, this is the wrong direction. As I said, AI could be a blessing. AI could be a curse. So now, because of the profit-making intention of the businesses, it is pushed into the direction of a curse. It will remove me from the job so that they can reduce the cost of their operation and their bottom line becomes fatter than it used to be. Simply that consideration. The fact that you have removed a human being and what happens to that human being is not my concern. My concern is to maximize my profit. And that's what I'm designed to, I have designed my business to do. So that's the direction that I say, that, my, that artificial intelligence can kill people too. And they'll be using for military purposes very soon, or already they're doing that, I don't know. So is this what we should be supporting? No, we don't. Uh, to, again, uh, there's no, there's no base, there is no way we can allow uh, technology to be destructive to human beings. We don't accept a nuclear weapon uh, to destroy human beings on this planet. So the nuclear weapon had to bend. So there's a nuclear uh, uh, power, nuclear, uh, sorry, nuclear uh, uh, weapons uh, has to go end from this planet and now this is it so anything which is destructive which is harmful to human being that has to be protected that should not be, technology should not go in that direction technology is to support people's life not destroy people's life so that's the way uh, we'd like to do similarly in uh, in the case of the artificial intelligence Fantastic, sir. I'll just take the last question. I think we have answered most of the other questions which are being asked uh, through your uh, discourse. Yeah. Uh, GK asks, in order to reduce or stop rural migration, do we need a special policy similar to the special economic zone or social economic zone uh, for starting any services in the rural uh, location? How can we make it up, uh, possible? The way I tried to frame that answer in the, my presentation, saying that... Uh, this for the first place there's no reason why anybody should leave home to become migrant workers because i couldn't provide them the opportunity so he or she's looking for that opportunity somewhere else which i couldn't why didn't i do that because i'm told that rural economy is a supplier of labor and nobody's paying attention to do anything because you keep on breeding people and uh, rural urban areas will absorb if you if they cannot absorb you have an unemployment problem in your rural area. Uh, and we can only give you the job at the very bottom. Since you are illiterate, since you have very little education in the rural areas, I have not arranged any education for you. So you do our cleaning our house, cleaning our factory, clean, or do the little 
things. And, and if you can learn something along the way, you can go a little bit up. But you are always in the low, low paid jobs. That's a rural thing. I said, this is all because of the conceptualization of what rural areas should be. I said, rural areas could be as a strong economy as to compete with the urban economy. And they are in a better situation than urban economy because the technology has changed again. Before, you had the infrastructure in your favor. The rural economy didn't have the infrastructure, didn't have the roads, didn't have the uh, airports, didn't have all those facilities and so on. So you are... Uh, you have to come to the city for that. Today, it's a different. The, uh, uh, the communication technology has made it very easy to reach out any place, anywhere. So you, that's not a big deal. And the, and the transportation is running through the whole country. So now any place is as good as any place else. And the technology of running business doesn't need to be uh, in one place, uh, in one building. You could be spread out wherever you want. So today, any place in rural areas could be uh, as good as a place. And I say it's a better place. It's a cheaper place. It's a more healthy place. And uh, you can create a new environment for you. It's a, it's a green environment. It's a kind of a, a smart environment, which is difficult in the urban areas and so on. So you locate all your IT industries right there in the villages. So you become a competitive economy and deal with the, uh, sometimes you collaborate with each other. Sometimes you compete with each other. But you are on your own, if you're on your feet. You are not an appendix to the uh, urban economy. You, you are uh, an economy by your own right. Once we do that, all the jobs, all the things will fall in place. You don't have to leave the place because we are creating those jobs uh, within our place. And our aim would be in the rural area that nobody should leave home uh, to find jobs someplace else, unless it's so attractive that uh, uh, we will be happy to let you go. But if it's just for living purposes, it's just a livelihood purposes, you don't have to live. We have enough room for you to take care of your life. Fantastic thoughts, sir. Nobody should have to leave home. And, Absolutely. And micro-entrepreneurship needs, uh, uh, needs to be recognized and brought forward more. What a wonderful right. conversation, sir. Such an honor to right. have uh, seen you. I'll just ask one last parting question, sir. Uh, from what I know, more. <laughs> huh? I said you still have one more, <laughs> one, one more question. More. <laughs> uh, from, from, what I, from what I know, sir, your birthday is coming up on 28th of June. Uh -huh. That's right. Yes. Yes. How yes. are you planning to celebrate the birthday? With uh, the I don't plan anything. I, I'm not the guy who's uh, very uh, fond of celebrating birthdays. So. Anyway, thank you for mentioning that. We uh, wish you a, a, a happy birthday in advance, sir. Okay. On behalf thank of, you. Uh, thank speaking you. To all our audience. Thank Such an honor, sir. Thank you very much for it's sharing great, your insights. It's, it's a great pleasure meeting you. Thank you. Sir.